Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In Plato's dialogue, The Euthyphro, the end part of it is occupied by a discussion which tries to frame piety or the holy in terms of justice. And the reason why they do that is because in their discussion it turns out that Euthyphro's initial attempt at, at defining piety as what the gods love or what they approve of, what's dear to them, what it is that they like, can't really be followed through, at least in that dialogue. It turns out to be a property of piety and not the definition of it. So Socrates sort of puts a bug in his ear saying, well, maybe it's part of justice. And Euthyphro latches onto that, and it makes good sense why he would do that. I want to dwell on that for a moment. When we talk about justice and we're using it in the sense that it's used in the Platonic dialogues, or really in any ancient, medieval, even early modern philosophy, it has a broader sense than the, 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 the sense that we often give to it today, it means fairness, it means the right sorts of relationships between people, or in this case, people and the gods. It means following through on things. We often tend to associate justice with penality or criminality and, and its punishment, um, or with um, ways in which things are apportioned in a society. For the Greeks, it extended much further and so it, it would make sense to actually think of the holy or, or piety on the part of a person as a virtue, as, as a state of being, as being in the proper relationship with the gods. So following through on certain things, if you make an oath to the gods, actually fulfilling the oath, um, doing the sacrifices at the proper times, praying to the gods at the appropriate times in the appropriate ways, all of those sorts of things would, would fit into it. So that's a, a fairly natural way of thinking about this for an ancient Greek like Euthyphro. And this dialogue shows you just how radical, in many ways, Socrates' own theology turns out to be, because the objections that he's going to raise are ones which can be taken in one way for somebody like Euthyphro, who sees the gods as something like super powerful versions of human beings, and they can be taken in a very different way for the kind of theologian, if we want to call him that, that Socrates is, for whom the gods are these totally self-sufficient, never doing anything wrong kinds of beings. So, um, the suggestion is that piety could actually be a part of justice, and then the question would be, well, what part of justice is it? And Euthyphro says, well, that's an easy one. It's a part of justice that has to do, and there's a key term here, with service or taking care of the gods. Now, this is where we get into all sorts of interesting difficulties that Euthyphro is not conscious of right away, but Socrates is steering him towards. Um, because he's going to ask, well, what happens when somebody does service? Let's think about human beings and their service, their relationship of service or taking care for other beings besides gods. If a human being is taking care of a flock of sheep, the human being is making sure they don't fall into holes. Sheep are pretty, actually, pretty dumb, actually, and, and have to be watched over. The wolves don't eat them. <clears throat> they don't get led into some place where they'll eat something poisonous to them. Um, we go through a whole bunch of different examples with this. And we can do this for other animals as well. The human being who is taking care of the animal, it's going to be somebody who's actually competent in that, and they are going to benefit the animal. 
So you're better off having your dog under the care of a good veterinarian than just you know left to their own devices. Or if you're taking care of your dog, you make sure to get the burrs out of its hair to um, you know comb it for fleas or give it a flea bath or give it the medicine that'll kill the fleas. Unfortunately, in ancient, ancient Greece, they had fleas everywhere and couldn't get away from them. That's why they use them in examples. Um, but in any case, the idea is that <clears throat> there's a relationship, not only of care and service, but of some sort of benefit accruing to the one to whom service is being done. And that benefit, if there's going to be a benefit, that means that you're moving from a case of a worse to the better. Somehow the condition of the gods is improved by us doing service to them. Euthyphro sees that this is a problem. The gods need to be understood as being relatively self-sufficient, as being more powerful than us. So in what way am I going to make Zeus or Apollo or Athena or Poseidon better? It's not like I'm going to come across them and they're sick and so I give them some medicine or they're, they're having a down day and I, I talk to them and smile and now they feel a little bit better. Because that's not really the way things are for the gods. We can't do favors for the gods in any meaningful way. And so Euthyphro tries another attack. He says, well, it's not like a person taking care of an animal. It's more like the case of masters and slaves. Slaves attend to the needs of the masters. Um, slaves did, in fact, almost, you know, all of the meaningful household labor, if you actually had slaves, if you were poor, um, your ox was your slave, animals were your slaves, as, as, as Aristotle remarks. So what kind of, what kind of um, therapy, what kind of uh, douleia, what kind of service could slaves actually give to masters? Well, they can provide them with sustenance, they can provide them with entertainment, they can provide them with, you know, massages when they, they need them. They can do menial work that produces fabrics. They can, you know, we can run through a lot of things. But again, are any of these sorts of things analogous to what human beings would be rendering to the gods? I mean, we can weave a nice cloth for an altar, but... God doesn't need that cloth, or the God, or the gods. Um, you know, we can, we can kill animals and, and carry out sacrifices and, and you know, burn the, the particular parts, fatty parts, and, you know, certain parts of the meat, and, and have the smoke go up to heaven. And in the anthropomorphic consumption of the gods that, that Euthyphro is working with, the gods like that sort of thing. But it's not like the gods are actually deprived. It's not like they're actually in a, in a situation of need or necessity the way that human masters are with slaves. That's one reason why people enslave other people, so that they can get the slave to provide them with what it is that they, they need. So none of this really makes sense according to, to Socrates, and, and Euthyphro sees this problem. Um, so then they, he says, you know, what are the, the many and fine and noble things that the gods produce? Let's look at the other side of the, the equation. And Euthyphro is willing to say, yeah, okay, I, I think that the relationship is actually sort of a two-way relationship. And this, this part over here, we must have gotten that wrong. But we do know that... <clears throat> There's a back and forth here, and justice regulates that. And we know the gods are doing their part because, you know, they've, they've created things for us and they're really beneficial for us and they take care of us. Um, what can we do in response to them? <clears throat> and this is, I'm going to use some Latin words here. Um, there's an old way of talking about this, do ut des, I give so that you give. And one way of understanding uh, human religion, at least certain aspects of it, 
um, particularly in relation to this kind of commerce with the gods, is of a back and forth relationship where one person gives so that another person gives. Something analogous to like what the Greeks had in terms of guest friendship or xenia, where somebody would go and visit another person and when they come to visit they bring gifts and the other person gives them gifts, they send them away with gifts. And the whole idea is that um, there's, there's an exchange going on and that exchange is regulated by justice. So, what's the problem with this? Well, we know what the gods give us, but what can we possibly give to the gods? Um, this is where Euthyphro is saying that, that piety or holiness is a science, a discipline, a, a study of sacrifice and prayer. And so what can we give to the gods? Well, we can give them... Um, sacrifices and prayers. And now here comes the puzzle. What the hell do they want those for? I mean, the sacrifices, if, if we have a conception of gods as kind of limited creatures who actually do care about the aromatic smoke going up to heaven and you know enjoy that sort of thing the way Homer represents them, then that, that makes sense. But if we have the, the more uh, lofty conception that the Socrates, and it even seems Euthyphro is working with, then that doesn't make quite so much sense. Um, what are we actually giving them and sacrificing? Not, nothing really. What about the prayer? Well, the prayer is an interesting part because the prayer isn't really giving them something. It's asking them to give back to us. We say, uh, oh, Poseidon, give me a, a safe voyage to Egypt so I can bring back the, the wheat or the barley or whatever it is that they're growing down there and my ship won't you know, go astray or founder or wind up in some foreign land where they kill me for my cargo. Um, there the human being is asking the gods for that, but why do the gods want to be asked about that? That's not helping the gods out at all. So once again, it seems very one-sided, and here's the, the interesting part. It almost seems as if this relationship of service or care, there's nothing that the human being can actually give. And Euthyphro does actually try, you know, one other tack. He says, um, what can we give the gods? Worship, honor, goodwill, Again, does this benefit the gods? Is this a giving so that they might give in return? They don't need any of this. But they like it, and that's a reason we could give it. And now here we get to you know, the end of the dialogue, because Socrates says, you know, Euthyphro, we just went through this long discussion about the fact that, you know, the gods like something doesn't actually tell us why it's the right thing, why it's the pious thing to do, why it's the holy thing. Um, <clears throat> we've defined piety in the, in the past as that which is pleasing to the gods. It looks like you're trying to do that right now, but that, that didn't work. So if this is going to just lead us back to piety is what the gods find dear, what the gods like, or what the gods enjoy, that's not really going to help us. We started out with a new attempt to try to find some definition of piety in this, and it seems like it leads us back to the same place, just taking a detour through this notion of care or service or exchange between human beings and gods. So that's why the dialogue ends operatically, that is, in an aporia, in, in a not being able to make it through, to, to crash into the other side, to get, you know, find a path that will actually take you through the defile and give you what the essence of piety or holiness is for at least these Greeks.